Thanks. Can you hear me, Emma? Yeah, loud and clear. Good, thank you. Always worth doing a comment check. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm conscious we are covering many time zones in these uh, webinars. Um, so, for those that are, that have turned up um, at maybe a difficult time of day, I thank you very much for this. Um, so, uh, over the next uh, sort of period of time, hour and a half or so, uh, this is this webinar uh, is going to focus now on as we move out of the documentation stage and into sort of the the, uh, the building and flying stage, I think this is an important chance to, to look at and review that. So first thing to say is for, well done for, to all of you for, for getting this far. Um, I know how hard it's been and as, and as Lambert and the team will come from the judges point of view, there's some fantastic work done on the design documentation thus far. Um, so we want at this webinar, I so said we want to focus a little bit more on, you know, uh, as we move into the X-plane, which uh, Christina will cover shortly, and then into the, the actual fly-off event, FR, FRR, sorry, and then the fly-off event, and we'll cover those, some hints and tips and tricks on, on those to do. But before we sort of get into that, um, we've got a real great opportunity here from uh, Dr. Butterfield and uh, Scornade Altsoni from um, the RAF into additive, additive manufacturing and, and 3D printing. So uh, both, uh, you know, a uh, chance to just to learn a bit about where that work is going, um, but also certainly from uh, Dr. Joe, uh, some hints and tips as he has looked after the, the, the team for many, many years at Queen's University in Belfast and have some hints and tips on 3D printing, some do's and don'ts, which as we get towards the competition will, well, I think will, you'll find most useful, useful, which I think that I think the summation that will be, you can't print your set way out of some basic design and, and, and work. So I think that'll be the thing you'll hear from this. So um, we'll, we'll set me through this, conscious that we want to leave some time at the end for sort of questions as we move into the event. Um, I'll hand it over now to, to Joe and Alan. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, the, over the next 20 minutes or so, uh, myself and Alan will cover, as Paul said, the, the topic of 3D printing. My slides cover some basic principles related directly to the UAS challenge and then Alan will follow up with some broader um, contextual material on the use of 3D printing on, on full scale aircraft. So a broad spectrum of, of applications, um, but plenty to think about in terms of what you're designing yourselves and preparing for, for this year's UAS competition. So I'll just share my um, screen and we get the, the, the slides going then. So. Can I just confirm that what you're actually looking at now is the, the, the slide view and not the presenter view? Yeah, yeah that's so. Perfect. Well done. Well done. Nobody else can do that. So well done, Joe. You've clearly okay. Perfect. Preparation is everything. OK, so just by way of an introduction to to ourselves, I'm, I'm speaking to you today from the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering in, in Belfast. I'm a senior lecturer here where I teach aircraft design three uh, and manufacturing systems for across our um, degree programs in mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering and um, product design engineering. And today's topic is 3D printing for unmanned air systems, but mainly in the context of the UAS competition. Our pedigree goes back over 10 years, and this slide presents year on year progression of, of, of how student undergraduate student projects, group design projects have been used to, to design unmanned air systems um, starting in 2011. And if you look at the three layers in the diagram, top, middle and bottom, our first three to four years were spent discovering how to get aircraft into the air dependably, dependably and, re and repeatedly. And we, we, we generally did a good job there with, with winning the uh, BMFA electric lift challenge in 2013. Whenever the UAS challenge came along in 2015, we put our first submission in there and pretty uneventful from our point of view where communication errors brought our uh, aircraft down reasonably early in the competition, but a, a good learning process, but back to the drawing board there. We came back in 2017 with a, a reasonably good aircraft, but again, autonomy, autonomy let us down, a dependable design, a functional design, but the avionic systems then were, were still a challenge. Um, and then again, when we returned in 2019, then with with two aircraft, we 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 managed to have a vintage year, uh, two podium finishes for our aircraft, second and third, 
And that's the point where we had really developed the systems to, to, to a stage where we were starting to get competitive. And so having learned about the aircraft over the first three or four years, the autonomy and the avionics over, over the follow on three to four years, we've then since then optimized our systems to fully integrated uh, UAS platforms that, that perform really quite well. 2020 was the first year of COVID um, and our aircraft won the design prize that year. And 21 was arguably our, our, our best aircraft out of the box. This, this system flew autonomously and identified the color and character on the ground uh, on its first flight. Unfortunately, due to the travel restrictions at the time, we couldn't actually compete with that aircraft. But in 2022, we returned with the, the Anthus team and, and finished second. So our journey then, as I say, is split into three, four year blocks, understanding the aircraft in the first instance, understanding the autonomous systems and the avionics over the next few years. And now we're at a point where we're fundamentally improving the quality of our systems. And part of that is how we manufacture them. And within our manufacturing systems here, the, for the UAVs, 3D printing now plays a, a significant role then within the, the construction of the aircraft. So not only does performance improve over those uh, 10 or so years, but the build quality has also improved with the, the better uh, construction methods that we're using. So the rest of the presentation will look at our workshop capabilities, 3D printing from the perspective of Queen's, uh, applications for UAS systems that we found for 3D printing, how they relate to some design fundamentals, and then some observations and considerations for you to take away with you. We have access to a fully operational workshop here with the usual suspects in terms of manufacturing, engineering components, drilling, milling, turning, and welding as well for aluminium and steel. We also have our water jet cutter for, for flat materials that could be metals, composite sheets, whatever, unidirectional cuts and then you know students pass on pdfs or dxf files for, for for those to be manufactured but because we've integrated our 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 design build activities with our curriculum we often compete with other modules and other activities within the school the um, formula student car being one of them and we often find that our our builds could be delayed if we depend on the main workshop for our uav parts so we try to avoid the bottlenecks then by designing our aircraft, which is also a good design philosophy to use lightweight materials and ones which can be made within our prototyping lab. There we have access to our flatbed laser cutter, which can cut up to 25 millimeter depth uh, MDF, unidirectional cuts, just like the water jet cutter. We have a five axis CNC foam cutter, which can do our uh, aerodynamic uh, wing forms and empennage shapes and so on variable shapes, tapers, and so on. And again, driven by PDF and, and DXF files. But we also have a suite of 3D printers, which is now mainly based around five Ultimakers, where we can use the, the PLA, uh, which comes in at about 35 quid for a 750 gram roll. And we also have a Stratosys BJET 30 Pro Polyjet technology based 3D printer as well, which we've had for a number of years. But Having said that, the material um, for that machine now is actually, you know, eye watering in terms of, of cost. So we have to keep cost and manufacturability in, in mind for, for in, in both cases. So what do we use them for? We have in the past built what are effectively uh, trust based, almost construction systems that you might have used or when you when, when you were smaller to, to, to build uh, frame type structures um, at home. Um, we have laterally then used them for cowls and, and covers. Um, and we've also put them into use for um, servo um, containment, um, which does two jobs. It, it handles the mechanical load of the servo whenever it's in operation, so the loads are transferred to, to the structure. And it also uh, gives access to the servo should they need to be changed, which does need to happen. In the past, these would have been wrapped, hand wrapped with uh, solar film, or we may have gone to the bother of trying to vacuum form these, but the, the, the 3D printing has filled a gap there for those, those types of structures. Other useful things have been custom control horns. And now given the fact that these aircraft are going up to about 10 kilograms and, and uh, over two meters in size in terms of wingspan, 
very often the off the shelf control horns are of a size that are meant for, for model aircraft. And we've always sort of said, well, we need something bigger for these aircraft. And so we've started to look at making our own control horns now. We can also come up with, you know, shock absorbing uh, wheel designs, which which we have used. And given that the, the so-called lightweight wheels that we've been buying this year aren't really that lightweight, these are a good solution to, to get your overall weight down as well. Um, and then main structures. And I have a question mark here because of the slides that follow. We have used the um, the, the, the Vero Blue in the picture that you can see here for connectors between the main parts of the empennage. And then we've used the the materials that we have for the um, ultimakers then to make the main wing joints then for at the points where our wing spars all meet. But there are cautionary notes whenever you start moving into uh, main structures for the aircraft. The basic principles of flight still apply and we find that our groups always take these into account and can can come up with designs that will satisfy the needs of, of creating a uh, lift in order to carry the weights and overcome the drag. Um, the flight loads, takeoff, cruise and landing are all well understood concepts. Um, but whenever it comes to landing loads, there are there are occasions where we found that our undercarriage and the way it integrates with the aircraft can can be improved, let's just say. And then there are other things whenever we design for the loads that we know about and have included in our analysis, the, the structures will perform quite well. But very often we can get caught out by loads that we haven't considered. The balsa ribs that you can see in this aircraft are very strong whenever the uh, solar film is placed across the top and tightened. But very often these can be broken when they're being handled during manufacture. The, the 3D printed um, sockets that we use for the wing spars have been physically tested and analyzed to prove that they can stick, take the static flight loads. But then there are significant questions then when it comes to impact loads and indeed the loads that they're uh, subjected to whenever there are uh, fasteners attached to them and they can very often mean uh, failures. And what happens there is that there's a gap between what we assume for our analysis and what we actually find in the aircraft very often a wing will be analysed in isolation where the wing roots are simply constrained within the model, but we don't properly consider joint loads and how loads are transmitted through the structure. And it's only by looking at the overall system in terms of where the loads go, how they're transmitted through to different parts of the structure, um, that you'll get an optimal system then that covers all eventualities. And we do the main structures well, but interfaces and joints are always something that we could do more on. And, you know, we, we, we have seen failures because of uh, poor joint designs. So in terms of our observations and considerations, then load paths is the, at the top of, of the list. If you design an undercarriage to take an impact load based on a landing where you have to come back down with the payload still attached, you, very often you might put a load factor on that to take two or three G times the, the actual working load. Um, but consider if the undercarriage can take the load, what about the structure that the undercarriage is attached to? And if the aircraft is capable of, of, of the wings are capable of lifting the aircraft, then what happens when the loads are transmitted to the wing routes? These, these things are possible banana skins and loads on the first flight can very often open up joints, which can lead to a failure on the second flight. And so the lesson there is, is test early and test often. 3D printing gives you the opportunity to, to generate fairly complex shapes, but complexity is still something that you should design out of your structures if you can. Just because we can make them doesn't mean they are optimal. The principles of Boothroyd and Dewhurst and design for manufacture and assembly still apply, albeit to our new technologies. But just because we can make it from a 3D printer doesn't mean that it's always the best solution. We referenced some costs there earlier on. And there can also be penalties then when it comes to uh, cycle times and lead times. If you've got a five day print going into a machine uh, during a bottleneck period and the run up to the, the your test flights, that's a problem. So keep it simple is, is the rule of thumb. The fused dep deposition methods then also mean that you need to be aware that the, the final prints may not be as strong as the data that you're, you've been given for the current polymer material. 
So physically test the prints and try and align your finite element models with actual products as opposed to material data that you might get from a supplier. Otherwise, you, you, you may be faced with a disappointment when it comes to test days. And 3D printers have turned up at the competition over the last couple of years. And that's, you know, uh, a, a risk mitigation strategy should you need to make something, but try and think of your um, replacement parts in advance so that they can be printed in advance. You have a limited space within your work area at the competition and the 3D printers may be something that you could you could do without at that stage if there are uh, if you plan ahead. Now the photographs that you can see here, I haven't referenced those yet, but you can see a 3D printed nose cowl on the on the top image here, which which took the main impact of of, of our aircraft from last year. Um, this actually happened, you know, just about a week before we actually traveled over to the competition. So it had to be rebuilt uh, pretty quickly. But because we were testing early, we were able to recover the situation and that Team Anthus then finished second um, in, in the overall competition. So the lesson here is te test early, test often uh, and make sure that your material and processing choices match what the, the complex system has to deliver whenever it's in the air. And with that, I'll hand you over to Alan for the second part of the, the presentation. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'll now try and show my screen. See if you can get this smoothly done. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Yeah, that's perfect. Fantastic. Um, so, um, sir, ladies and gents, um, thank you for inviting me in to do a very quick synopsis of 71 Inspection Repair Squadron and our current and future capabilities. Um, 71 Squadron are, um, so I'll just run through a very quick area of what we're what we do right now, and then we'll move into the additive manufacturing scenarios that I've put on the screen in a moment. Uh, so the key areas for my squadron at the moment, so I have 150 people um, that are to do MOD fixed wing aircraft repairs. So category three and category four repairs. So as you can see on the screen, so we go into very detailed strips, uh, manufacture and repair of aircraft fixed wing. Um, we also do non-destructive testing of all MOD fixed wing aircraft and rotary aircraft on operations. So if they're in a um, overseas on ops, um, my non-destructive testing teams deploy out there as required. Um, we also have a defense aircraft weigh team. Um, so a small team of specialists that go around the country and weigh all the aircraft um, within defense to ensure that um, the, the weights and balances are correct as they move forward and the operators can um, do their calculations correctly. Um, other areas in my te um, team very quickly just to cover them off. So I have a repair design authority, so we are DAS accredited, um, so we can do in-house repairs uh, schemes for the teams to then implement on aircraft. Uh, we also run the tri school of NDT and fiber reinforced plastics. Um, we also run an in-house structural repair co training course for the aircraft repair teams. Um, I also run a TMEC, so um, for controlled items that need calibration over their years. Uh, a standard conventional workshops for aircraft component manufacture, which then leads into the additive manufacturing side as well. And also we're looking at in the future becoming the tasking authority for all RAF workshops capability across the country. Um, so we should be able to coordinate uh, the specializations within each of those hubs and ensure that Air Command um, get the correct capability out from those specialist areas. Um, so the main one that we've been uh, we're talking about is additive manufacturing. So under uh, Project Warhol, um, we are looking at additive manufacturing and advanced manufacturing for the coming years. So Project Warhol is a three year innovation research project, as it mentions on the screen, um, for us to understand additive manufacturing technology. Although this is a technology that has been around for 20 plus years now, um, it's it's only now the technology is getting to a place where people understand the pros and cons and how it can help make complex um, components smaller, lighter um, and more um, better for future aircraft. Uh, we have got, as you can see there, we have got 3D printed parts on our current platforms. Um, and then obviously we've got future combat air systems or Tempest as most people recognize it as. Um, one of the estimations was 40%. I understand that that 
percentage is coming down. Um, but there will be areas on that aircraft that will be added manufactured. Um, and for my team, when we are going to those aircraft in 15 years time, because it has got a hole in it somewhere, um, we need to understand that technology of how it was made, how it was manufactured and how we can then repair it going forward. So this is a um, the actual project warhol is there to give us an understanding of this technology and whether or not it needs to be a core capability or whether or not we just need to understand it and work alongside our industry partners. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the capability that we've got, so um, Stratus 450 polymer printer, we've had this for about 18 months now. Um, it, that uses um, all levels of polymer, including nano carbon fiber. Um, so it can be used for aerospace technology and components. We've also recently had our Active Manufacturing Centre set up. Um, so we are setting it up on lines with industry um, so we can match that because we are going to have to aim for the, um, the top end of Active Manufacturing, which is certifi certified aerospace parts. Um, so we have invested on um, into a lot of good technology. So Redishaw 500Q, um, it's a standard that's been around since about 2016. If you go to any additive manufacturing center, you will find at least one of these, if not five or six, because they'll use different materials in the different machines rather than having to rotate and clean a machine, which can take up to a week to get it properly done um, so that you can use different materials. So industry tend to go down the route of having aluminium in one, titanium in another, and, and so on that way. So they just have a machine. But if they have a number of components, like Joe has mentioned, where you are stacking them up, then you are obviously reducing your capability from one machine if you've only got one type of material in that. Um, the second uh, second metallic machine that we've got in our facility is the Whalen Caliber 3. Um, this is at the cutting edge of technology now. So this is an e-beam. Um, there's only two companies in the world that produce um, e-beam machines. And this is the main first endeavor by Wayland. Um, and one mach machine that we've got was number two off the production line, and it's actually going to be the first in the world to be operating. We're hopeful that it gets handed over to us next week, but we've had that in our facility now for six months, and there's been a few teething problems, which you get with new technology, which always has to be factored in. The um, final part of our facility, which is one of the key elements, is a um, 3D um, scanner. So um, so that we can do a number of things so we can scan to CAD, we can reverse engineer. Um, and also the key element for this will be for us to be sure the um, porosity and density of any component that we actually manufacture. That's a, a key element of our assurance when we go forward to look at certifying aircraft and um, components for our fleets. Some of the areas that we have to look at, and this is where we are at the moment, is looking at all the different elements from um, QMS and um, health and safety, facility processes, pre and post processing, inspections, quality control. These are all the elements that we are having to tick off and ensure that we've got a process or a method in place to assure our customers that the product that we produce is repeatable and it's um, to the high standard that required from them. Um, the certification hierarchy that I've got on here as well, this is another layout. So the first slide was more to do with the facility, but this is a key. This is all has to be built up. So if you go out to a industry partner and they produce you a additive manufactured part, then you are looking at having all this and all this documentation in place to assure yourself that your aircraft part is um, fit for purpose. Um, whilst you're doing UAS, um, I know that obviously you'll be self-certifying your parts because you'll be making them and testing them yourselves. And if you um, don't do that and they fail, then obviously they, it wasn't up to the standard. And so that's the lessons learned. And that's where we are right now with our project, which is where um, I can then go through a couple of our um, parts, bits and pieces and um, use case matrix elements that we've been trying to get an understanding of for this project. So first areas, off aircraft tasks. So some of the things that we've been producing, um, and looking at how we can use additive manufacturing um, in the future. Um, so a number of examples here from uh, number two there, there are um, countersink dibbers. So they are assurance checks. So while my team are drilling and countersinking sk aircraft skin, we can assure ourselves that they've done the, the right countersinking um, 
grading and depth to make sure that it fits correctly. Um, number one up there is a drill guide that has been produced for the F-35. So whilst they've got a repair to do on that program um, to ensure that it's done in the right place in the right orientation, the drill guide has been manufactured. Um, and then a couple of other ones on there. The um, number three is um, a Typhoon Avionics Bay recovery program that we've got on, um, hopefully in the next couple of months. Um, we produced the um, templates for that repair as added manufacturing, and then they will be taken to the aircraft to ensure that they are correct so that we can assure ourselves that we produce the via conventional manufacturing, um, the right shape and the right orientation for that component. Some of the areas that we've used added manufacturing off aircraft for a start. Um, one of our recent ones um, was again off aircraft. This is a training R, so, um, so body armour. Very heavy, um, 12 kilograms on of weight. Um, our air crew use this when they are even in simulators. So, so, and what was happening was our air crew were some of our crew were getting um, back injuries through the weight of the um, body armor while they're sat in the simulators. Um, what we did we did was we took the plates, we scanned them, we produced them in polymer, um, and it's down to less than one kilogram in weight and. Um, and now they've got the bulkiness of that to get in their way while they're doing their simulator, but they're not going to get the weight impact um, on their backs. So obviously alleviating that problem while they're um, training. Final one um, on aircraft components that we've been looking at. Um, two, two areas that we are looking at at the moment. We've got a timeline of trying to have an aircraft part fitted by July and flown. Um, this will, won't be a certified part, but this is a route that we're looking at going down to see how we can get this project um, to a key milestone. Um, so at the top there, we've got a Puma Morse banking plate on the top left hand side. That's the original. Um, we've produced a number to ensure ourselves that we are building it to the correct standard and the correct sizes and dimensions. Um, we have in the middle two pictures, two, two and three, we produced one in aluminium, that's uh, picture two, and we produced titanium, picture three. They have been fitted to an aircraft to ensure that they fit. Um, the next step on that will be that we produce a number of items that are then assured and checked and measured all the way through to destructively testing to ensure that our component meets the requirements of the design. Um, and then we'll be, have a comparison against those for any others that we produce in the future. Uh, this is a part that um, is not available to the force and is a requirement that they need to be fitted if they've not got their um, sensors operating. And so this is going to impact the, op the operational um, fleet if we don't have these produced and so we're ha happily to put this onto our project to actually un understand the lessons find where the barriers are for us to be able to produce aircraft components uh, and actually get them fitted to an aircraft um, the bottom pictures as you can see there they're polymer um, 3d printed brackets that have come from a french design for the a400m so the fleet has um, a problem with when parachutists and bags go out the side parachute door, uh, the static lines are rubbing and damaging structure on the inside. Um, so the French um, Air Force have come up with the design, a 3D printed design where they um, have a bar between the top, middle and bottom bracket so that um, the static lines are just taken away from the um, surface and the structure of the aircraft to stop any damage there and also helps with the load load masters being able to pull the ropes uh, the static lines back in afterwards as well so that was um, test fitted um, three weeks ago on a400m and we're hopeful that we'll have that fitted to an aircraft quite soon as well um, we're we're looking at using a slightly better grade polymer than the french have used um, just to ensure that it's stable and that um, it won't um, break under um, usage. So those are just some of the key areas that we've been looking at with that. Um, I'll just reinforce what Joe said. Um, whilst we are looking at additive manufacturing, it's not the utopia for manufacturing. Conventional manufacturing and additive have their, yeah, they're both manufacturing techniques. It just gives you another option. Um, I completely get that for complex parts, there is a tendency now to think about additive manufacturing as being the only way forward. Um, but as Joe has mentioned, and I'll reinforce that it's definitely, you need to be looking at the type of component, the price, 
the timing to produce it and also the operational imperative which is from a military side is do I need to get this aircraft flying quicker than conventional or additive would give me so it's a it's a whole package of understanding what you need and when you need that part um, if I need to get an aircraft flying um, quicker and additive will be quicker but it will cost me three times as much that's a call to be made if whether or not that cost is better than actual having an aircraft sat on the ground. So those are the that's the assessment that we're looking at over active manufacturing as we go forward in a military aerospace environment. Um, I will put up a very quick if there's any questions. Silence from the audience. Hopefully I've not logged off. Um, I'll just say thank you very much. Um, and um, the organisers have got my details. If anyone does have any follow on questions from my organisation, then I'm more than happy to answer those. Um, when you have your OAS challenge, um, my team, Aircraft Specialist Repairs, uh, Repairers, will be at the UAS to help you with any fixes that you need on the day as well. So I look forward to seeing you on that day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. Th thanks, Joe. Uh, really useful. And I hope you all found that um, as interesting as I did, um, <clears throat> both from a sort of a where additive manufacturing is going, um, and certainly the high-end uh, bits we, we were talking there about how do we certify aircraft parts to potentially replace more traditional, um, noting the comments have been made about the fact that it doesn't, I don't think, it, well, maybe for some time, replace, totally replace uh, some more traditional aspects. But I think that's, uh, you know, really interesting. As you enter your careers into hopefully into aerospace, um, which is hopefully where you will go, um, then you know this is I know conscious for your for your for your journeys on your career. This is going to become more and more of a, of a significant part. So it's hopefully you'll find that useful. And also Joe's hints and tips from 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 his experience and his team's experience over many years of that. And again, I just ask you bear that in mind as as you as you move through now into your sort of your build phase. Uh, and I said that you can't print yourself out some basic uh, requirements. So, so thank you, Joe. Thank you, Alan. That's really most useful. So I'll hand over now to uh, just to, to give updates from, from the various key aspects. Uh, first of all, I'll hand over to, from, to, to Lambert from a judge's point of view uh, and where we are at the moment. Lambert. Thank you, Paul. And hello, everybody. Um, if you'd like to go to the next slide, please, Emma. Right, well, a brief update on where we're at, as I hope you're all aware that we've got quite a long way through the, the paperwork part of the, the challenge. And so you've completed your concept papers, the two design reviews and your design and development specification. And I hope you've seen the feedback that we've given you on those that's been uploaded onto Mashoom. And um, please take note of, of the feedback we've given that we hope will be helpful to you. Um, you'll see on the right is just a random set of your illustrations that you provided in your design and development specification. I've just selected a, a few at random here, which shows you that we should have a really interesting competition fly off this year. I mean, there's some some interesting and quite diverse designs. Um, so it'd be very interesting to see how these come along. And there's been some excellent work you've done on the, the paperwork side. So thank you for that. But what we've got left to do, as I got through most of the paperwork, but it's it's now your explained simulation that Christina will go through in some detail shortly. There's still a bit of paperwork on the flight readiness review, but also that includes the video and Rod will go through the detail of that shortly. And we also have you to bring along a poster to the, the fly off event and um, a PowerPoint or some form of presentation for the Dragon's Den business plan. And finally, of course, it's the flying itself, the exciting bit at the end. So next one, please, Emma. So just looking at the, the dates um, going forwards, um, just to remind you, reminder, the, the X-Plane simulation must be uploaded by the 5th of June um, and the flight readiness review by the 16th of June. We don't mind if you load them up early, um, as that obviously helps us. But 
you must leave, load them by those dates. That's absolutely essential. Um, then you, you'll bring along the A0 A poster to the uh, demonstration event, and then you'll give your Dragon's Den presentation um, during the, the fly off um, at a time when you're not flying, obviously. Um, we will also, as judges, um, be going around talking to you at the demonstration event. And of course, we will be doing the scoring um, of your, your flying activities. And then the award ceremony happens at the end of flying on the 29th of June. The next one, please. So just a reminder of the, the scoring, the paperwork accounts for about 100, well, for 150 points altogether. Um, the explained simulation, another 150 points, and the flight demonstration is 500 points. So that's the way we've set it out this year. So there's more of an emphasis on the flying than we've had in previous years. Um, I would just make the point that although the flight readiness review is, is only worth 20 points, it's absolutely essential that you complete that. Um, so you do get some bonus points for it, but it must be done um, to enable you to, to uh, come along and fly because it's uh, essential um, safety paperwork involved in that. So next one, please. So looking at the 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 detail of the scoring, um, and again, Christina will go through this, but just a, a brief overview at the moment, those 150 points are made up of the steps that you, that you will be doing when you're flying. Now, one thing that's really important here is that your X-plane simulation is of the aircraft that you will be bringing to the competition. So it should be way the same, have all the same dimensions, and its payload mass that you load on to, to explain must be the way, same mass as the one that you will be intending to fly with at the competition. And the batteries that you use must be the same batteries that you will be using at the competition. So this is not a separate exercise. This is part of the journey towards the fly-off. But Christina will go through in detail about that uh, shortly. So next one, please. Then the mission itself um, is the 500 points that um, the storage and flight readiness worth 50 points is is done um, in the rules. It gives the impression that you you will do that and then immediately move the, the flight line. Um, we will, in fact, do this offline, if you like. It's not um, at a convenient point um, so that we don't hold up the flying process. But so you will go um, unpack your your uh, your aircraft um, and get the, the scoring on the timing it takes you to do that and the quality of your, your storage and, and your assembly process. The flying then, the, the major part of flying is your your humanitarian aid payload drop, the cargo drop worth 225 points. And then following that, if you've still got um, energy and time left of the 15 minutes allocated for the flight, you can go on while still in the air doing a number of endurance loops um, before you land. And so that's how the the um, the points are made up. Now the energy efficiency score is quite difficult for us to do. Um, we will be doing some measurements on your battery um, when you land, so it must be easily accessible to um, uh, to get at the battery connections um, once you've landed. But we also ask that. Um, you download from your autopilot the energy that you've used during the flight. Now, you, we will look at that after you've left the flight line because we don't want to, to uh, hold up the flying, um, but no cheating, please. Um, 
so that well just um a few more points you're only allowed five minutes in preparation time once you get to the flight line um once you the the flight safety officer have give, given you your briefing you've got five minutes to get your your aircraft ready to get up in the the air and that includes loading catapults for those of you use, using catapults um, if you fail to do that within five minutes you will be um, asked to leave the flight line and you'll have to go to the back of the queue the total mission time is 15 minutes so you must land at 15 minutes um, and any flying that happens after that won't be scored in any case um, do look at the rules exactly how these the the points are, are worked out um, and this year again slight difference to last year that you can have up to three attempts at flying over the the two days but the score you'll get for your flying is the highest score you got in your three attempts so it's not an average or anything like that um if you it, you know your second flight is the one that scores the highest that will be the one we will use for working out the uh, the grand champion and the other the other prizes so next slide please Just a reminder, again, read the rules, but um, the A0 poster, um, it lays out in the rules what we want to see on that. It's about your design. We want you to highlight innovations and we will come and talk to you at the, in the pits about those as well, um, how you've addressed safety um, and looking about the environmental impact and anything you you doing in your design that lessens the environmental impact of your um, your aircraft. But please bring it along to the demonstration event. And the next one, please. And then the Dragon's Den presentation. Again, you'll do it some some point during the, the two days. Um, it's a, a presentation in front of sponsors and, and judges, maximum of 15 minutes. Um, and we want you to tell us about your aircraft, how it meets the customer requirements, details about the costs and things like that. So your business case as to why your customer might want to buy your UA, UAS. Um, Again, talk about the environmental impact, talk about how you promoted it, your design to schools, the media, using social media, et cetera. And so a short presentation, you can bring along your aircraft or bits of aircraft into that presentation area. Um, but if you are using PowerPoint type slides, um, you must bring your own laptop into the presentation we are not accepting presentations on, on USB sticks or anything like that. You must do it on your own laptop, please. And the next one, please. So just a brief reminder about the awards. So the grand champion is the, the summation of all the points, all 800 points that are potentially there. So it comes out of all the paperwork, the X-plane model and the, the flying itself. And so it's it's the aggregate of them all. And there's a runner up prize for the second highest scorer and the third place. And then there's what we call an advancement award that we give to either a new entrant or a previous entrant who has made a significant progress from where they've been before. The next one, please. And then there are a whole series of other awards um, which are, are allocated by the judges and scrutineers um, and the safety officers looking around um, at the event. And so they're made up of things you 
told us about in things like the design and development specification and other documents, um, but also by our obs observations at the event. Um, and so the design award, for instance, is what you've told us about in your PDR, CDR and, and specification. But we will actually look at um, your your aircraft and make sure that it actually um, looks like what you said you're going to do in your in your paperwork. And a good example is the, the safety award. I mean, some of you have written some really good good um, approaches to safety in your your design and development specification. But we will be watching you and um, just writing about it um, without implementing it and acting in that way um, will not get you a, the award. So um, we want to see you um, operating safely in the pits, on the flight line, walking around the the uh, the pit area, etc. Um, in addition to the uh, the score we get given you for your paperwork, so there's a whole variety of things there. So there are plenty of awards um, at the competition. I think that's over. So I will now hand over to to Rod, who will talk about the FRR and scrutineering in some detail. Thank you. Thank you, Lambert. Um, Emma, shall I just share off my screen? It'll probably be easier as we build. So hopefully people can see the opening slide there. Uh, good afternoon. I'm the Chief Scrutineer for the UAS Challenge. And uh, as Lambert has said, I'm going to run through the flight readiness review, the FRR, and the scrutineering brief. So what is the FRR? It's a formal requirement to provide the evidence that your UAS is safe and ready to fly. As Lambert has said, we expect your submissions by the 16th of June. But what does that include? It should be a 10 minute video of continuous flying. You should have also got pre-flight checklists and completed the form 701, which you should be able to find on the on the Mashoom system, which has a, a number of requirements um, as shown here, uh, including reporting your corrective accident actions and uh, and any changes you've done, and the signed direct declaration by a chartered engineer. Your 10 minute video, which you should keep as simple as possible, should show all phases of flight from the preparation for takeoff to maneuvering, landing and recovery and identify when it's under manual flight control. A note for the demonstration of payload dispatch. This should be completed on the ground in accordance with CAA regulation as you're not permitted to drop items from your UAS uh, when you're flying uh, outside the BMFA um, uh, constraints that we have. The Form 701 contains significant amount of detail about your UAS, and it is important for us for scrutineering. Uh, as you fill it in, it'll be the areas shown shaded in blue, um, which you'll complete uh, with a summary detail uh, of your UAS. It requires considerable technical information about the equipment and systems fitted, such as the motor system and notably the battery details, such as whether they're 6S um, 2500 uh, milliamp hours, etc. If you find you've got details that don't fit into those boxes, you can always uh, include them uh, as attached, additional attached documents or enclosures. Again, what I would urge is you keep it as simple as possible, but make it easy to read and therefore easy to mark. When you've completed the form, you should sign it, uh, as you can see up at the top, uh, and PDF copy it um, prior to submission to us. So that's flight readiness review. What is scrutineering? 
Uh, what is the definition of a, a scrutineer, uh, as ever trawled from uh, from Wikipedia? A combination of scrutiny and engineering. And for UAS challenge, scrutineering is the final phase before flying where we will inspect your UAS. This should take less than 20 minutes, but requires considerable effort from you to be appropriately prepared. You should not be taking, undertaking any last minute adjustment or fettling, and all the documentation in your F-700 aircraft log folder should be up to date and signed off. This is crucial to avoid queues and delays at the flight line. We'll inspect your UAS and ask a series of detailed questions about how you organized your team and designed and built your aircraft. The inspection itself will come in four phases. All recorded in a form 702 in your aircraft log. These elements are checks of compliance with the rules, a detailed airworthiness and integrity inspection, flight control and functional checks prior to the flight line, and an assessment towards the scrutineer's prizes. As you pass through these stages, you will be awarded stickers to show your progress that you will apply to your UAS. So phase one is the safety and specification compliance checks. And here the accuracy and detail with which you've completed your form 701 FRR certificate is key in helping us assess your UAS. You should also have any supporting documentation available and we'll undertake detailed compliance checks such as of the weight visibility of parts and your batteries. The next phase is visual inspection for airworthiness where we assess your integrity management. This is in three areas, structural, propulsion and systems integrity. In these we're looking to see if your systems and controls have been put together securely and that you've considered all integration issues. Critically we will look at fasteners. Examples are shown here of what options you have for the use of lock nuts or lock washers where bolts are shown in safety with more than one and a half threads showing or secondary means of security such as araldite or torque seal which indicates when vibration has loosened nuts. For wiring and soldering we will also look at the quality and neatness to prevent slack wires interfering with control runs, mechanisms or accessibility. When this phase is complete, you'll be awarded the red sticker for passing scrutineering. You'll then move to airside for the controls and functional checks on your UAS. This will be a, to um, ensure that your systems operate in the correct sense and direction and that your payload release and flight termination systems work as required. You will also have your timed assembly run, which contributes to the operational supportability prize. And on completion of this phase, you will be awarded the AMBER Functional Checks Complete sticker. I've mentioned the aircraft F700 log. This is a crucial part of the airworthiness audit trail. It should include as a minimum your F701 flight readiness certificate, the F702 scrutineers checklist, and finally the F705 aircraft flight release certificate. You've already seen the F701 form, which you will have completed for your FRR and sent in to us. On page two of the 701 form, you should have included cropped pictures providing evidence of those systems, and page three provide some useful tips on how to approach the FRR and indeed the fly-off event. This includes what you need for your video, technical and organisational elements of scrutineering and your procedural checklists or flight cards. On the Form 702 <clears throat> Scrutineers Checklist, we record your compliance, integrity and functional checks and mark you for the scrutineers, airworthiness and operational supportability prizes, which cover design quality, such as compliance and ease to inspect, maintain and transport, airworthiness integrity from the inspections, 
and your team procedures to ensure safety, quality and configuration management. The Form 705 Flight Release Certificate covers the various stages of scrutineering through the flight line and with the flight safety officer. And you will need these to be signed off by the university team captain and the IMECI representative supervising each stage. And all proceeding actions must be complete and signed off before proceeding to the next serial. So in summary, be prepared for scrutineering. It requires, requires that you thoroughly check your documentation, that you've practiced putting your UAS together and getting it ready for flight using flight reference or procedural cards. And critically, that it is put together in a robust and safe manner. Finally, in order to help you, we've also put a couple of best practice design guides on the Mashroom site to help you. And the current F700 forms will also be there. Good luck for your final preparations, and I look forward to seeing you all at the end of June. Thanks, Rob. Really, really clear. Um, I guess you're putting your slides back up again. Hi, Christina. You're happy to update on uh, the notes. A couple of questions on the side as well on the XP model, which you might want to incorporate. Yeah, I'll handle the questions later because I can't see both at the time but I'll start with the slides. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk you through the elements of the X-Plane model. So different to previous years. Um, I know we've done a virtual competition the past two years. This year it's all been incorporated into one and there is a prize for the best X-Plane model that will be across all of those uh, submissions, whether attending the actual event or not, there will be one award awarded to the highest scoring X-Plane simulation model. So why are we doing this? To demonstrate your final design and provide a method of testing um, the performance of your aircraft prior to you actually doing your flight test and arriving at the event. A key component, so there's 150 points available, as Lambert's already discussed, for the entire of the X-Plane uh, element of the competition. I'll discuss the breakdown of that results, uh, at those points shortly, and I'll just go through a couple of different guidance bits for why you're constructing your X-Plane model and your submission. So within E7 and X of the rules for the 2023 rules. So there have been changes from the 2022 rules. So please make sure you're looking at the right uh, rule version because it's really important. A single compressed zip file that contains the airplane. So this is the ACF file objects textures. It's up to you whether you want to make it as jazzy as you like with pictures on it and um, with colors. What we're actually looking at is the real performance parameters. Uh, and the actual structural design and those elements rather than that. But it's always great to have a look. Ensure all your subfolders contain all the required information such as aerofoils, etc. If you're going to be put inputting your own aerofoils and not using the standard ones in built to explain, make sure those are all labeled correctly and all the correct information is there. Do not alter the names of those subfolders. Sub so if a folder is called Aerofoil, don't change it. Um, X-Plane itself won't then pick up on those changes and will struggle to load them when we load them into a completely fresh install of X-Plane. So don't mess with those subfolders uh, names. The only name you should be changing is your zip file name, and that should contain in a specific format that's put in the rules. So your university name, your team name, and then your team number as well. So there is a format for that in the rules. So please make sure that you are aware of that and that you put it in the correct one. Once we load it into XPlay, and that is the only distinguishing factor we have between each of the teams on what you've submitted. If we can't tell the difference by that folder name, we don't know what you've actually submitted and we will not spend half an hour trying to figure out which team hasn't had a score and which team has. So it's really important that you do that where we're looking at potentially having 28 to 30 teams submitting these. 
Aircraft will be viewed in PlayMaker to check key component characteristics, such as total weight, payload, battery capacity, etc., as detailed within your design documentation. So within all your design documentation and for your actual flight live events, you've said you're going to you're going to be carrying X amount of batteries, X amount of payload, your wingspan is going to be X length, all those key characteristics. We are actually going to be sampling five of those. I'm not going to tell you what those five are, but we will be sampling five of them to make sure that they are correct as per your documentation and that the requirements for that. You'll also be required to submit a pilot handbook along with your submission of any key information for the pilot, such as controls, payload weight, changes since the previous design review, etc. So there are constraints within X-Plane as there are with any simulation software. If because of your design of aircraft, you have identified one of those constraints in X-Plane, the pilot handbook is your chance to explain and provide justification as to why you haven't exactly replicated what you were going to say, what you said you were going to do. It is also the chance for you to explain to the pilot. So every one of these uh, submissions will be flown through a representative uh, environment of the MFA Buckminster. It will look exactly like the challenge that will be presented at the live events. Uh, the only difference is it will be flown manually, not autonomously through that. So when in that pilot handbook, you need to explain to the pilot the controls of your aircraft. If they are not standard controls, um, you need to say how it needs to be set up, how the controller needs to be set up. If your aircraft has brakes, we don't assume that they have brakes, so you need to tell us that they do. So all those key information, your start of procedure for your aircraft, if you were going to fly it manually, we also need to know because we only fly these twice and you get 15 minutes cut off time each time. If it takes us 10 minutes to figure out how to fly your aircraft, you've already lost essentially one of your flights. So it, for, to you to be able to get the best score possible and to allow the pilot as much time to get the performance of your aircraft and understand its key performance characteristics and how to turn corners, et cetera, it's invaluable that you provide this information to them. And as I said, justify any of those changes. If you have found those, uh, there are constraints. Um, explain them within there and you won't be penalised for them then. If we can go to the next slide, Emma. So, as I said, each act playing um, submission will be flown through an environmental model of the competition and two attempts for that aircraft. Your aircraft must successfully load and complete the call to in the elements of scoring. So when you are checking your file, once you've created your zip folder, please send it to another team member or to someone else on a completely fresh install of X-Plane that has never loaded your aircraft before. Because that is the only way to test it, how we will actually see it. If it fails to load then, X-Plane has got a very good memory. It will always remember your settings from the previous one when you're using the same install. It's great for that, that's not great though, of the likes of this. Uh, when we are looking at it with a clean slate, a fresh pair of eyes, we need to see, we need to be ensured that that's going to be able to open, fly and load correctly. So please make sure that this is the case. If you submit your X-Plane model early, and I don't mean with 10 minutes to spare on June the 4th, we will check that and load it up and make sure it's correct. But don't do it at one minute to midnight and expect us to check because we're not, we can't do that in that case. There are too many teams uh, for us to be able to do that and a short amount of time in which we can judge this. If any team is unable to get their aircraft working in Desiree configuration, e.g. multiple changes can be made to produce a working aircraft, but they must be explained in the pilot handbook. De develop the X-Plane model throughout your design process. So I know we've given this presentation multiple times and we've I've tried to hamper through that simulation should be used for each element of your design and just testing it, making sure your structural rigidity is there, all those different aspects, making sure uh, one of the key ones X-Plane will show you is actually on the landing when you're putting in the speed, the forces, etc., that you would experience, whether your aircraft is going to lose its landing gear. It's very good at showing you that. Um, so these are the key aspects. You know, we want to be able to each aircraft not to fly once but to fly multiple times at the live event so all this is part of that 
design performance and gathering all the information you need to ensure that your aircraft will actually have that ability. I entirely remember checking your load on your aircraft into a fresh install of X-Plane using the process prior to submission. I've reiterated this point multiple times, but we have had it in the past where teams have not checked this. And then when we have come to load the aircraft, despite every piece of work that they've done and it's heartbreaking, it does not load. Um, as I said, within the Annex E7 of the rules, it tells you there how to load your payload. So the payload needs to be loaded as a water payload. So under payload and weight, there is a specific setting and it's just a tick box that says payload water. Uh, so please follow that. There is step-by-step -step instructions in there on how you should do that. Uh, but I know we've had a few teams that have asked the question, but please go into the rules and you'll see that step-by-step -step guide. Uh, and the next slide, Emma. Okay, and I've just broken down the X-Plane model scoring a bit more from what Lambert talked about previously. So the total score is 150 points. The pilot handbook, 25 points. Plane maker check. So this is where we will open your aircraft in plane maker and we will look at all the conditions and all the information that you have inputted. So examples of this are power supply, wings van, payload weight, aircraft, C of G, propeller sign. I'm not going to tell you what they are, there are just some examples, but we will pick five and we will be judging against them. Five points available for each one of them that is correct. And we will be asking you why they are not correct if it is not explained. Explain mission scenario. So this is worth 100 points. So take off. Uh, with 10 points, so same as the live event, you get 10 meters to take off. If you take off within that 10 meters, uh, 10 points. Uh, waypoints, so there'll be eight, point, eight waypoints at five points each with a maximum of 40 points. Payload drop, if you successfully drop your payload, it's worth a, a potentially up to 25 points, depending on the weight, the payload weight that you have carried. Landing without damage, so this is an important one. Um, landing with your aircraft intact so that is where 10 points if you land but your aircraft is not intact you will receive zero points so it's important that you make sure that you're landing with an intact aircraft energy efficiency 15 points so we talked about how we calculate that uh, previously but uh, maximum 15 points available there and a total mission time of 15 minutes with aircraft given two attempts at flying so what i will reiterate here is the fact of in previous years, what separates between a lot of the winners and for each of those awards and the grand champion, the runner up third place, can be as little as 10 to 15 points. So if you fall on any of these, that could be your difference of you being the grand champion of, at the entire fly off event or even the X plane scoring. So it's important that you do each of these elements and you go through the process that we are doing and you allocate the right amount of time to producing each one of these. So I think that's everything for me in terms of PowerPoint slides. Do you want to go through the questions now, Emma, or do you want to leave them to the end? Thanks, Christina. I think let's leave all the questions um, to the end because I think we're, we're nearly done now. Um, but thank you okay. very much. Great, thank you. Um, so just um, I'm just going through to take us through a couple of um, things and the first of all is just I want to remind all teams about the insurance requirements. Um, so the first is the public liability insurance. Um, teams are required to uh, make sure to have adequate public liability insurance is in place and this must be in place before um, being on site at BF BMFA Buckminster. Um, teams must have £10 million cover in place. Um, in order to obtain cover, I'd first advise speaking to your university as many will have um, this cover in place. Um, so you should be able to obtain proof of cover from um, your university. Uh, in addition to the public liability insurance, the team pilot is required to hold personal accident insurance for flight risks, um, covering both um, development flight uh, test flying 
and the demonstration event at BMFA Buckminster. Um, the BMFA does offer specific price insurance for members. Um, alternatively, companies such as Flock may be able to offer suitable US insurance as well. Um, finally, teams from outside the UK are also required to present evidence of medical insurance um, covering participation in the fly-off event. Um, teams will be asked to provide proof that all the necessary insurance is in place during the FRR um, review submission um, stage. Um, so if you do have any concerns about any of the insurance, please do speak to us and we'll do um, we'll do our best to help, um, help you um, with those. Um, in addition to this, um, sadly Chris was unable to, to join us but today, um, but I'd like to draw your attention as well to 3.3.1 um, to, uh, in the tw 2023 UAS rules. Um, please make sure you have read this section of the rules if you haven't already done so to check compliance with UK drone regulations. Um, it is really important that you have read that section of the rules if you haven't already. Um, so now we'll move on to the arrangements for the fly of event in June and um, it will take place from Monday the 26th to Thursday the 29th of June um, and it will take place at BMFA Buckminster um, which is near Grantham. Uh, the address is on the slide there. Um, in terms of getting there, the closest train station is Melton Mowbray which is about a 20 minute drive away. Um, Parking is available on site, so there'll be plenty of parking for everyone, so there will be no concerns there. Um, teams should arrive on site between two o'clock and six o'clock on Monday afternoon. Um, there is an essential briefing that all teams must attend at six o'clock on the evening of Monday the 26th of June. Um, that briefing won't be repeated, so please do make sure you're on site by six o'clock on the Monday. Um, Tuesday will be primarily for scrutineering and any test flying for overseas teams and then the main competition flying will take place on the Wednesday and the Thursday. Um, the event is due to finish with the awards ceremony which should take place approximately um, four o'clock, four till five in the afternoon and then clearing up should be complete by seven o'clock on the evening of Thursday the 29th of June. Um, so uh, free camping facilities will be available on site um, at BMFA Buckminster from the Monday until the Thursday. Um, yeah. The campsite will need to be cleared by the Thursday night. Um, again, any concerns there, please let me know. Um, toilet and shower facilities are available on site um, and there will also be a catering van um, on site for um, serving breakfast and lunch. Teens should bring their own food with them to, to um, eat on the campsite for dinner. Um, disposable barbecues are permitted, however, care must be taken when using and disposing of these, and barbecues must be off the floor, um, so no barbecues on, on the grass. Finally, if um, there are some teams who haven't um, applied for their airdrops, uh, Dropbox systems. So if you haven't done so already, please do yeah, um, contact um, Michael Cook. Uh, his email address is on the screen there um, to um, order yours. Um, Michael just needs your university name, uh, your UAS challenge team name and a full delivery address. Um, you can actually ignore this comment um, because they've now they've now changed this and they will they will they will cover any shipping and handling costs, um, so do not worry about those costs. Um, just uh, place the order with Michael and he will send those to you. To be honest, you can, you can so have I'm yeah. now going to hand over to Bernice, who's just going to give uh, an update on the repair tent. Thank you. Just uh, giving a, a quick check on my comms. Uh, yeah, loud and clear. Thank you. So we, we are aware that things don't always go according to plan and that um, sometimes on, on transport to the site or uh, 
during the the flying event itself that things uh, can can get broken. So what we've done is we've got a, a repair tent, and as Alan's uh, already said, we've got a number of people that are from his organisation, as well as from my organisation, 1710 Naval Air Squadron, that are going to come along and and help put things back together again. Um, we've got a, a number of tools that we'll be using that can be used for metal, wood, polymers, composites, uh, anything that I can think of. Um, so if you need any uh, additional support um, and guidance on that, we've got all of that there as well. From the fact that uh, we know that um, if you're, especially if you're coming from overseas, that if you've um, brought your tools all the way with you then it, you know you may have had trouble getting them through customs with battery packs or, or whatever so don't worry about that i'm bringing a whole selection of those sort of things i won't be bringing any 3d printers um, and i won't be having 3d printers brought into the hangar for us to supervise if you do uh, want to bring along a 3D printer, can you please let everybody know and then um, we could um, make sure that we've got allocated space uh, and power supplies for them um, rather than everyone running their own individual ones from their own uh, pit lane and, and over, over uh, taxing any of the generators. So uh, if you could let us know on any of those sorts of things. Um, and I'll, I'll look forward to seeing you there and hopefully not using our services. That's never going to happen, Bernice, and you know it. Um, right. <laughs> I've, I've, put a, I've, I've got a question on there that says about the fact that I've put in um, a dust extraction. It's a HEPA one, so we can, in, we can use it for all materials, including carbon, glass fibre, uh, wood. So if you want to use the 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 repair area for something so that you're not contaminating your own work area with dust um uh, fibers or or anything like that you're welcome to come along and do that work in the tent cool thanks Bernice. uh emma is that is it questions now just pick up any questions for the next last 10 minutes or so yes indeed Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to just work them down as we go down. Um, I think the first question, Lambert, maybe comes to you about the efficiency question. When you're briefing on about efficiency, about the uh, the battery remaining, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, um, this is a tricky one, really. You need to do the research on your batteries because all batteries have different characteristics. Um, but I mean, the reason for the 20% is clearly a safety one so that you don't run run out of energy before you've you've come into land. And just like when you catch a civil airline, they have to have um, <clears throat> sufficient fuel for a diversion, et cetera. Um, uh, they can't just come down with with uh, the tank empty. So um, we will be doing some measurements on your battery. Um, but you need to to do your own research on the particular batteries you're using um, to ensure that uh, their discharge rate so that you can do as close as you can to uh, to leaving 20 percent energy remaining. Thanks, Lambert. OK, I can't just people haven't got their microphones off, so if that any other follow ups, that one come back. So, so Christine, there's a couple of questions about x -Pay. Do you want to pick those up? Unfortunately, for some reason, I can't see the chat. So if someone can read them to me, I will answer them. OK, so the first one was. You said you have to model autopilot, but I think you've covered that that is a manual only. So I think that's covered. Yeah. Uh, it's they can choose to put a cockpit or some autopilot elements in. But in the end, for us, it will be flown manual um, at your the speed that you tell us to fly. If you have a desired speed. Uh, with the payload that you tell us to fly uh, and any other parameters that you want us to set before flight or limitations you want us to adhere to, all that has to be in the pilot handbook. Yeah, thanks. Next question I think we probably covered is about fixed, is it fixed waypoints or are they programmable? Fixed waypoints, so there'll be fixed waypoints we have already put in. 
it will basically be two flagpoles that the aircraft will have to fly through. And as long as it can make that turning, uh, then you will get the points for that waypoint. Thanks. I think the final one, I think we, we've talked before, but a question here is, would un uninstalling X-Plane and then reinstalling the same computer count as fresh X-Plane? Because it obviously we've said before, it remembers the old airplanes, doesn't it? So if it's completely wiping it from your computer entirely, not just clicking the uninstall and then reinstall, that will still remember. If completely wipe it, take it completely out of your system and then reinstall it will work. Uh, just be careful that your computer has actually completely uninstalled it. Yeah, I think that's just, that's just what well, I guess, one of the benefits of the explain that they've got themselves, again, please keep keep an eye on that. We've heard that before, whereby it, uh, it does, does not want to forget things. So there we go. It really um, does it. <laughs> so, which I'm sure is a great idea at the time. I think we've covered the uploading of forms, and, and you mentioned that one, Rod or Rev, Rod or um, previously. Um, the next one, I guess, was around. Da, da, da. So, uh, there's a question here about uh, uh, about bringing a spare airframe. Um, I guess I don't again number. I think if the well, I think it's a big, big issue. No. Like, like any spare thing. Sorry, Christina. They can bring any spare that they want. That they want. Yeah. Yes. Remember, you've needed. got restricted space in the in the pits. So, um, um, yeah. But you can bring bring the spares that you you uh, you want to bring. Yeah. Cool. It, it can't it can't be bringing a second aircraft that's already. It's all. It's different to bringing spare parts that you can that you can replace. You know a spare airframe but you can't bring a second aircraft if that makes sense cool hopefully yeah again that answers up thank you there's a couple of questions about public liability insurance um do you want to pick them up now emma or do you want to take them away yeah i'll, I'll take those uh, offline yeah thanks and again I, I, we are conscious of overseas teams that there, there are some challenges here yeah. so please uh, as we said before you know we, we want you there we want you to fly you know, um, the whole aim of this is, is to get you enjoy the competition and fly, right? So that's, we are here to help. Um, so, you know, please, if you've got any questions, particularly over the insurance, make sure uh, Emma and the team get them and, and she will answer those questions for you. Next question is around um, sponsors. Uh, um, so so the, the issue is, this is obviously as a competition, this isn't a public attending event, that would entire whole different ball game of liability insurances, et cetera. Um, all I'd say on that one, again, you probably want to take this one away, Emma, with, with your team. This is an imec -E call uh, and a little bit of Buckminster. I would say that uh, we would wish to know who's coming along. We need to know who's coming along. We, we, sh we have to limit the numbers. They have to be team members. And if they're not team members, they're sponsors. We need to understand why they're coming along and, and, and how we can manage that. So um, on that one, again, you probably want to take that one away, Emma, and look at and maybe re reply back to that one specifically. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Paul. So take care. Bye bye. Cool. Um, that registration again. Chris isn't here, so I don't know. If you, you want to pick that one up with Chris later? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll send that one to Chris as well. And there's also, I noticed in one of the questions, Bob, someone's asked, um, and also there will be a pilot provided during the challenge, right? Um, so do we also need to get team pilot insurance for the UK? Um, so, so that's um, well, so Chris will be doing the flying on on site. I'm not personally sure about the team pilot requirement insurance. Um, perhaps that's a question for Chris as well. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, but unfortunately, Chris isn't here. He would have answered that one. So we'll go back to on those ones because I'm conscious that is always a you need to make sure that's all righted. Uh, uh da, 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 right. Um, Christine, there's a question here. Um, I'll explain, uh, will the payload actually be dropped in the flight? And if so, can you give us an opinion on how we can do it in our own simulated flights? I guess that's probably us on how we do in simulated so the, Yeah, so the payload will be dropped in flight. So this is important why I said, make sure your payload is loaded as a water payload. When we get to the designated point for payload, we will press your button, your mechanism, wherever it is on your controller that releases the payload. And if it drops, and in explain, it will feed out to us whether it dropped at that exact point at which we pressed it. Um, if it does that, then you have a successful payload drop. 
we won't go any fancy than that. We just want to make sure that you've programmed in that mechanism correctly and selected all those parameters correctly within X plane. We're not measuring uh, how close did it get to the actual payload waypoint. As long as it releases it at the, at the point of which we command it to, that's all we need. Thanks. Um, the question there about the number of tents of camping and berths, again, and electrical hookups. Are you able to answer that one or do you need to come back? On that one? So uh, there's plenty of space on the continent for everyone, but we will be asking everyone to book uh, places in advance just so we know exactly how many teams to um, expect on site. Um, so there will be a booking form circulated shortly so you can book their places. but. Again, um, in terms of capacity, there's there's no concerns, so don't um, don't worry there. Um, there won't be um, electrical hookups available. Um, so um, yeah, unfortunately, that, that that's not. Um, yeah, they won't be hookups. Okay, thanks. So, from Team Twenty Seven about allocating XP mentor, is that something that you do, Emma, or, or through Christina? Yeah, I think that will be through us. I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to, um, but um, if they can send an email to the UAS challenge inbox, uh, detailing exactly what they're looking for, we can look to to help them. Yeah, so I think Emma, this question was raised. We said at the beginning of the challenge, if they wanted a mentor from the steering committee, they just needed to that could have a, an hour chat with them uh, over any questions. We open this to all the teams. I think they just, this team wants someone to speak to about X plane for that hour. So yeah, if you email iMickey, we'll arrange that for you and we can have, we can get someone for you. That's not a problem. But that is available still to all teams coming leading up to the event. Obviously you need to give us as much notice as possible. There's around 20 of us on the steering committee, each with uh, different uh, interests and different backgrounds and different uh, subject matter experts. So if everyone wants explain the week before explains you, uh, that we won't be able to match that capacity. So please, if you are looking to help something like that, get us into it as soon as possible. We can do that arranging. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. And that is open to everybody. Um, please, obviously, um, email and we can allocate you some help. Um, there's a follow-up, there's a come back on that question about the, the whole aircraft thing again. Um, of course, you can't see it, Christina. Lambert, did you want to come back on that? Well, I think as Christina said, I mean, we don't want whole second aircraft, complete aircraft, because, um, um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, a, a spare fuselages, spare wings, spare undercarriages, fine, you know. Um, um you know as spare parts but we're we, we're not looking to see two whole complete aircraft being there um so um um yes i mean it, it's just being reasonable about the the spares and and the fact that you're not getting a an undue advantage um um in just having a a, a complete replacement aircraft which will undoubtedly have different characteristics to the first one yeah, so one of the key changes in all the rules this year was yeah. we've made the rules less complicated in terms of additional challenges. But what we're trying to do is the competition now has been going for a number of years, developing a robust design that can actually take off land and repeat flights. And that's one of the reasons behind the change of, uh, you know, it's your best, your uh, average of two flights. No, it's your best scoring flight. We want to be able to see you repeating flights with the same aircraft or the aircraft being easily repairable because actually in the real life environment that's what your customer will be wanting that's your specification um, so we want to see that being implemented in your designs we don't want it to come off the flight line oh it's crashed and we need we want to fly again oh we've got another aircraft that's not a great selling feature of your your aircraft and that won't be a a solution that every that your customer will want here's a new aircraft it needs to be repairable it needs to be manual it needs to do the job it's intended to so think about it in those limitations and what we're asking for in terms of this is for humanitarian aid mission in the end 
yeah, that's me done. Yeah, thanks, Christina. And I think, um, Emma, keep me honest here, have we missed any questions that we haven't said we'll come back on? No, I don't think so. Cool. So, so again, we'll, we'll um, you know, if you've got any other questions, of having listened to the, the briefs, um, the, you know, these these webinars, as well as informing you, are there for an opportunity for you to, to, you know, to, uh, to go back on any questions and points. We, we would always ask you that you first reread the rules again, because quite often we find that the... <laughs> The questions are just in the rules, so, so please, please do that. However, if you've still got some questions, then obviously we are more than happy to, to answer those. As we said before, this is all about getting you there now and as many teams as possible actually at the event and flying. Um, some, you know, really helpful and comprehensive, uh, you know, briefs there from from the team uh, about what the next stage is to help to make it success with some uh, supporting information. Uh, you know that you can you can get access as well, which which again I'd strongly recommend that you 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 know you look at. Um, and I'd, I'd go back to Joe's point right at the beginning um, of many years of, of watching this as from a supervisor point of view, which is you know you can never test uh, or build early enough or test enough um, before you get to the event. And we will invariably find find that those that do better at the flight event are those who have had uh, time and uh, able time to to practice and. Uh, and to uh, to um, you know to to plenty of time to get to that point, rather than uh, flying crashing that five minutes before the event, um, and then having to run around at the last minute, which um, is not helpful for you or anybody, and and that would be really sad, or given all the effort you've put into it. So please think about that. Um, you know, uh, and make sure you give yourself plenty of time. Um, don't work up to always to the last minute deadlines, including things like you know the X-plane ex -play, ex uh, submissions. You know, you know we are happy to receive them early rather than later. Um, and stop you having a last minute panic when you know uh, it doesn't work at the last minute um, because that is how we you know we can need to work it so so anyway so yeah any more questions please um come back to to um, Emma and the team will pass them on and we will come back to you um you know uh, to make sure Eddie gets any answers but uh, to, to everybody who's presented uh Joe Allen but that, you know thank you very much and, and the team I uh, hope you found that useful um and we are very much Looking forward to seeing you at the end of June. I'll just remind you of the point that that Emma mentioned about, uh, you know, it is officially the summer in the UK, in England. Um, however, for those in might slightly warmer climes, um, that might still be quite cold. So please make sure you bring with you some warm clothing, um, because even in the summer in the UK and England particularly, it uh, cannot be as hot as we would like it to be sometimes. So please make sure about inclement weather. Um, we can do everything we can in terms of planning, but we cannot control the weather, certainly in the UK. But so, so please think about that as, as you, you come along. But any more questions you come along, we want you there. We want you to succeed. So so, uh, so good luck. And I'll see you. Uh, hopefully we'll see you all in, in, in just over a month's time. Thank you very much. Bye bye.